Society builders paved the way to a better world, to a better day. A united approach to building a new society. Join a conversation for social transformation. Society builders. Society builders with your host, Dwayne Veron. Welcome to another exciting episode of Society Builders. And thanks for joining the conversation for social transformation. We interrupt our normal broadcast schedule to explore insights from yet another amazing letter from the Universal House of Justice that just came out a few days ago on No Rose. Now, today we were going to start the process of wrapping up and bringing synthesis to the sequence of episodes that we've had on the science of depolarization. But a few days ago, the Universal House of Justice sent this message to the Baha'is in Iran, and this message was packed with incredible insights that just blew me away, and clearly that bring new light to our journey of society building. And so naturally, I wanted to immediately dive in and engage with all of this in a conversation with you about this new message. So put a pause on the science of depolarization, because we're going to get back to that soon. But today, we're going to explore this latest guidance, which builds on that message of November 28th, 2023. That's the message we studied together in episode 24. So today, we're going to study the message of March 20th, 2024. That's Nauru's of 181, to the followers of the greatest name and the helpers of the ancient beauty in the sacred land of Iran. Now, I want to start once again with a disclaimer. Remember, this podcast is not an official instrument of any Baha'i agency. I have absolutely no authority. My views are no different than yours. This podcast is just a personal initiative. Like you, I study Baha'i writings and guidance. I reflect. I try to read the societies around me and translate all of this into my own path of action. And on a very personal level, this podcast is a tool for helping me do all that. It's a commitment for regular study and reflection. And in this context, I'm thrilled to join with you in sharing in this journey and adventure. And I share this in the spirit of consultation as thoughts you can weigh and either accept or reject as you see fit. Okay, so on with today's podcast. Now, this message of the Universal House of Justice is another precious gift not only to its direct recipients, the Baha'is in Iran, but for the entire world. Because in many ways, this message is a continuation of that incredible message of November 28, 2023, that we studied together in episode 24. In fact, the second paragraph of this message provides an incredible summary of the November 28th message. So you want to read this paragraph to remind you of that message of the incredible treasures they reveal, explaining our social evolution as a community over the course of the past hundred years. But it also goes beyond the original message, giving us new direction and new insights. Now, for me personally, there are two things that really stand out in this message. The first is that this is clearly a love letter from the Universal House of Justice to the Baha'is in Iran. I mean, the Universal House of Justice showers the Persian community here with so much praise and admiration. It's such a remarkable expression of the incredible love which the Universal House of Justice clearly feels here. And it's a respect which was clearly hard won by that community's exemplary response to the relentless campaigns of persecution which they've endured and which they continue to endure. And hopefully, these words give some comfort and solace to such a persecuted community. Just listen to all the different kinds of terms they use throughout the message to refer to the Persian Baha'is. 
They call them the followers of the greatest name, helpers of the ancient beauty, the sorely tried and devoted compatriots of the blessed beauty, lovers of Abdul Baha, that they're like sweetly singing birds raised by the beloved's own hand, warbling in the garden of rapture and servitude that their hearts are aflame with the fire of the love of God and their breasts illumined by his heavenly counsels, that at all times they have been at the front ranks and advanced at the vanguard as valiant horsemen who have from the beginning of the faith to the present day ceaselessly urged on the seat of endeavor in the arena of service, overcome every hurdle and obstacle and obtain the highest prize and honor that they are guardians of truthfulness and integrity. They say that they are the solace of the eyes of the universal house of justice, who remembers them at every moment, lauds their perseverance in the face of unnumbered adversities, and that they beseech at the sacred threshold the well-being, genuine happiness, and true liberty for those beloved of their hearts and souls. I mean, wow! You see what I mean here when I say that they are showering the community with their love and admiration, right? So that's one dimension of the message. It's a love letter. But much of the rest of the message, I think, is really an extension of the November 28th message. It's the next chapter with new insights and in understanding the path to society building. As I mentioned earlier, this starts with that amazing summary of the message. I mean, this is the summary you should use whenever you want to try to remind yourself of the contents of that message, a summary of the treasures which they revealed in that treatise. Then starting with paragraph five, the message reiterates themes from the November 28th message, again, painting a picture of the dark crisis facing humanity and of our necessary response. And we're going to explore these themes further a little bit later in our podcast today. But then starting with the seventh paragraph, the Universal House of Justice brings a new sharper focus to our response going forward. And this is centered on the theme of us contributing to the establishment of universal peace. And in this context, they encourage us to study their message of January 18, 2019, where they explore this theme of peace further. Wow. So let's dive in and start exploring some of this. We want to start today really from the fifth paragraph of the Noru's message, where the Universal House of Justice begins, I think, to further elaborate on their November 28th message. Now, some of this is reiterating and adding color to that November 28th message, but where the message goes further, I think, and remember, this is all just personal reflection here, but where it goes further, I think, is in giving us much sharper focus on the cause of universal peace. This is a signpost which the Universal House of Justice is giving us in helping us navigate our journeys of society building. And in fact, towards the end of the message, they encourage us to study that message I referred to earlier the message of January 18th, 2019, which specifically addresses this theme of world peace. So we've got a lot to discuss today. Now we need to bring this message, the November 28th message and the January 18th message into alignment. So let's start with how the Universal House of Justice describes the state of the world today. This is something I always look for in these messages because it's such a precious gift that we get, this ability to understand what's happening in the world around us. It's such a privilege. So how does the Universal House of Justice describe it in this message? Again, it's dark, very similar to how they describe it in the November 28th message. In fact, there's a particularly powerful section where they say this, they say, the world is thus facing a profound and far-reaching crisis that is destabilizing and disrupting its order. Although this crisis is not new and the reasons for it are not unknown to the people of Baha, 
yet its destructive results and the consequent confusion are more apparent than at any time past. Wow. Its destructive results and the consequent confusion are more apparent than at any time past. That's powerful, right? That means something. I mean, think about how much suffering we've seen over the past few centuries, and yet this is the time where its destructive results are more apparent than ever. And think about the world's confusion, yet this is the time where the consequent confusion are more apparent than ever. I mean, this is powerful, right? And they also say, it is no wonder then that as a result of this crisis, conflict and contention among peoples and war and strife among nations are increasing day by day, and every pure heart and illumined conscience is oppressed and saddened thereby. And I think we can all relate to this. It weighs so heavily on our very souls, right? So once again, we see in this message a reflection on the state of the world with the disintegration eating away at our social orders. I mean, it's a dire picture. But of course, the Universal House of Justice share this not to frighten us, but to help us embrace our responsibility in working to release constructive forces to mitigate that suffering and much of that suffering, which is likely still to come. And this is the thrust of the guidance on helping us understand our role in the unfolding drama. And in this context, I want to jump towards the end of the message, where they translate this response into a very sharp point of focus. Indeed, they say, Today, the spiritual duty and moral responsibility of every conscientious soul is to serve the cause of peace and unity of the world. And here they give us that other gift, that reminder to study their message of January 18th, 2019, which provides much more detail on our path in promoting world peace. So let's explore that message. Now, the January 18th message was written for a very special occasion. It was for the centenary of the Paris Peace Conference at the end of the First World War. This is really the start of the process of building machinery for a collective security as a planet. And as the Universal House of Justice explains, there were three key moments where humanity reached out for a real lasting peace but always fell short because of weaknesses it could not overcome. So the first of these was the League of Nations, which grew out of that Paris Peace Conference at the end of the First World War. The world had experienced unprecedented devastation in the Great War, and there was a hunger, a true yearning, not to see this happen again. And the Universal House just explains how this was the first time that a system of collective security enjoined on the world's rulers by Baha'u'llah was seriously envisaged, discussed, and tested. But tragically, of course, it ultimately failed that test because it was fatally flawed from the outset. You know, when embracing change, people want to keep the status quo as much as possible. And in this exchange between a new world order and the existing one, the limits placed on the new rendered it incapable of preventing the outbreak of the Second World War. So the second key moment happens after the Second World War, again, in the ashes of the devastation that that war brought. Again, there was a hunger for change, but also that tension between the old and the new, and so new institutions were born to help uphold the peace. For most here, of course, is the United Nations, But it was more than just the UN. It was also a system of international economic institutions and historic advances in human rights and international law. Territories under colonial rule became independent, and all kinds of regional and global cooperations grew in both depth and range. 
Now, none of us listening today would have been around for that first moment at the end of the First World War. Some of us might have been around for that second moment, the birth of the UN. But if you're 90 today, you would have been only 10 years old at the time. So your understanding and memory of that event might be limited. But I think there were many of us who vividly remember that third moment, those days when we were watching our TVs and saw the falling of the Berlin Wall. You know, shortly after the end of the Second World War, a new global competition evolved between the world's two major power blocks, a period we call the Cold War. And for many decades, we lived in fear of the outbreak of a nuclear war. But the Cold War wasn't just about this fear of a head-to-head -head U.S. Soviet battle. It was also a global battle for dominance. And it popped up in numerous wars and conflicts across various regions. Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan. And it fed into countless civil wars across Africa, South America, Europe, and Asia. So let's go back to that moment in 1989 when we were glued to our TVs watching the Berlin Wall fall. I mean, this was a moment that none of us could believe. All of a sudden, there was a glimmer of the possibility for true peace. I know because I was there. In fact, at that time, I was part of a group of 40 Baha'i youth that had been invited into the then Soviet Union, the Promise of World Peace Tour, organized by the Baha'is of Hawaii. It was such an amazing moment. And let me tell you, the Russian people craved peace just as much as we did, probably even more so. And suddenly it felt like we were all going to see the establishment of that lesser peace promised by Baha'u'llah. A little side note here, I was saying how surprised we all were at that time. I mean, the end of the Cold War just seemed so incredibly impossible. But I remember on the eve of all of this happening that there was a clue that something was going to happen. And that clue was found in the six-year plan, launched in 1986, just three years before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And in that plan, the Universal House of Justice had assigned goals. And one of the goals for the U.S. Baha'i community was to settle pioneers in the Ukraine, which was a part of the Soviet Union. The Ukraine? Really? I mean, this truly felt impossible. I remember as youth, we looked at this with pure confusion. How was this even possible? I mean, you couldn't get behind the Iron Curtain. But three years later, things changed. So that was another one of those lessons that I learned about the power of this guidance from the Universal House of Justice. So the end of the Cold War was an opportunity. And even though we fell short, there was still considerable progress in all kinds of international cooperative initiatives. Now, the Universal House of Justice calls out a very specific set of initiatives, the Millennium Development Goals, which were a set of goals and targets addressing global poverty, education, the empowerment of women, child mortality, health, the environment, broadly what we call social and economic development. And while you might have heard of this, it probably isn't top of mind for any of us. I mean, it barely made the news, right? But here, the Universal House of Justice positions the Millennium Initiatives not in terms of their imperfections, but in terms of their contribution to the inexorable rise in global consciousness and our attraction to universal justice, solidarity, collaboration, compassion, and equality. So it was an important step forward. So these three key moments stand out in our advance towards world peace. But then the Universal House of Justice begins exploring the new challenges that we faced as we came into the new millennium. And in many ways, this was a retreat. 
instead of bringing us together, these new forces increasingly pulled us apart. Although we were successful in decreasing many of the extremes of poverty, for example, wealth further concentrated. There were new tensions in the interaction between citizens, governments, and society. Religious fundamentalism warped the character of communities and even of nations. And with the failing of so many institutions, public trust declined. And with the growing loss of that trust, there was systematic exploitation to further erode the credibility of all sources of knowledge. Suddenly, shared ethical principles, which were on the rise, began eroding, challenging our understanding of right and wrong. And the drive to international collective action, which had been gaining so much momentum, became assailed by forces of racism, nationalism, and factionalism. And so it is that the forces of disintegration are on the rise. Now, I want to pause for a second to further explore this picture, because I don't think it's easy to see the full vista of just how bad this all really is, of why this is all so unprecedented. These past few days, for example, I've been watching the news about Haiti. The images on TV are horrific. I mean, every day you see the desperation. Dead corpses burnt in the streets. Government ministry buildings abandoned, desolate, and now occupied by the homeless. Governments desperately trying to evacuate their citizens. I mean, it's devastating stuff. But how does a nation like Haiti get overrun in this manner? by what was previously just small gangs and hoodlums. We all tend to look at the moment it all goes wrong. But the truth is, it was going wrong well before then. Societies like Haiti were being corroded from within. As social institutions break down, as public trust and confidence erodes, society becomes vulnerable. And this, I think, is what the disintegration is doing. It's corroding our societies. It's making them fragile. Now, none of us know what the specific form that follows might be, what it might look like. But when you're vulnerable like this, it only takes a spark. Now, we know that none of this affects our ultimate destiny. As the Universal House of Justice reminds us, the unification of humanity is unstoppable by any human force. It's the next stage in our global social evolution because it's the only way we can address our problems in our truly interdependent world. So peace is inevitable. But the question we face is what price we pay for that peace. We can either embrace our future responsibly or resist it and pay a high price in suffering. And the Universal House of Justice makes it clear what the consequences are here. They say, as long as that call goes unheeded, there is no reason to doubt that the world's current state of disorder and confusion will worsen, possibly with catastrophic consequences, until a chastened humanity sees fit to take another step, perhaps this time decisive, towards enduring peace. Now, we have a responsibility to help the world respond to this call as best we can. But how? And here the Universal House of Justice helps further paint the picture. You see, the Universal House of Justice explains that achieving this vision of world peace requires a historic feat of statesmanship from the leaders of the world. But the will to even attempt this is lacking. And a big part of the reason for that is humanity is gripped by a crisis of identity. Now, identity is one of these watchwords of the new plans. 
you see reference to identity in almost every message of the Universe House of Justice. So that tells us that it's a very important construct. And this crisis is one where people struggle to define themselves, their place in the world, and how they should act. And what's missing here is a shared identity and common purpose. So without that vision, they fall into competing ideologies and power struggles, into the us versus them paradigm of identity. And over time, this splintering has weakened our social cohesion. What all of this is missing is the understanding that above all of this, humanity is on a common journey in which we are all its protagonists. Now, for our discussion today, let's call this the oneness of humanity paradigm. It's a lens through which we see everything. There is no us versus them. There is one humanity. We are a single, interconnected social organism. We are one. And yet, there's a paradox. Because at the same time, we believe that diversity is an asset. We appreciate diversity. How can we advocate for one humanity and for diversity in the same breath? And here, the Universal House of Justice explains this so beautifully. It clarifies our path. They say, it is through love for all people and by subordinating lesser loyalties to the best interests of humankind that the unity of the world can be realized and the infinite expressions of human diversity find their highest fulfillment. So it's our love for humanity which cultivates our appreciation for its diversity. How beautiful is that, right? And how do we cultivate this selfless love for humanity? Well, that's the task for religion. It's a spiritual ambition centered on cultivating fellowship and concord. But so many who claim to be religious instead use religion to fan the flames of fanaticism and prejudice. And so we need to help remind and reawaken people to the true calling for religion as a powerful instrument in unifying all of us as one humanity. Because as Abdu'l-Bahá reminds us, our desire for peace is not derived merely from the intellect. It is a matter of religious belief and one of the eternal foundations of the faith of God. And this then links back to our collective crisis of identity. Because another one of those key constructs that you see in so many of the messages of the Universe House of Justice is the coherence construct. And part of what coherence is about is having a balance between the spiritual and material dimensions of life. The crisis of identity is in part the product of us reducing our life experience to the material realm alone. But when you think about it, what really defines us, what really differentiates us, is our character. That's who we really are. That's what really defines us. And understanding that at a collective level, that character is about unifying us, about conquering our prejudices, about that unified paradigm I was talking about earlier, that's what we're talking about here. And so we promote the oneness of humanity as a fundamental spiritual principle, critical to our progress as a planet. Now, there's another construct which we see really almost always in the recent messages of the Universal House of Justice, and that's a construct we can call agency, that we empower people to become 
protagonists in their own progress, their own agents for change. And this is another really big idea. Now, we're not trying to convert the world to our views. We're working to empower people to see truth for themselves and chart their own destinies towards the betterment of the world. And as the Universal House of Justice reminds us, in this important undertaking, every member of the human family has a share. In purifying the heart and cleansing its mirror from prejudice on one hand, and in creating the social conditions for peace and unity on the other, every individual has agency and the capacity to play a part. All souls are able to promote the culture of peace and unity in their interactions with friend and stranger alike. Now, let's explore this idea a little further here because it's such a powerful idea. Remember earlier when I was talking about Haiti, how it had become a society corroded from within that was fragile and vulnerable? This is the story unfolding almost everywhere. So what can we do to strengthen our social fabric, to create the conditions for peace? I'd like to go back to what some of our recent guests on this podcast have shared. Remember how in episode 21, Dr. Peter Coleman talked about nations that had taken measures to address their threats to peace. In Botswana, Having seen how tribalism had destroyed neighboring countries, they introduced the truly radical requirement for civil servants to have to regularly rotate the regions that they were serving in, to get up and move to a different region for a few years, facilitating intergroup contact across their nation. He also shared how following a violent civil war, Costa Rica introduced a peace curriculum in its schools and how this has translated into it becoming a sea of calm in a region often plagued by internal strife. I mean, these are remarkable stories which highlight the benefits of peace building. Then in episode 25, Andrea Bartoli referred us to Galtung's framework for peace with peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building. This goes beyond negative peace to an expression of positive peace. And this was something which Neilan Parker was talking about in our last episode, how what really unites those 6,700 organizations in America that are working to adjust polarization, what unites them is their ambition for this kind of peace building, for a positive peace. And that's our lane. That's what we're promoting. We are working to strengthen our collective social fabric. And whether or not this averts catastrophes, it at least gives us the tools we need to best navigate through them. So here in this No Ruse message, the Universal House of Justice is calling us to act as catalysts working to awaken people's capacity to cultivate this kind of culture of peace, working to create, as Abdu'l-Bahá says, genuine love, spiritual communion, and durable bonds among individuals. And that's why this is all about our work in the plans, because this kind of culture of peace is exactly what the plans are working to build. Now, there's one more reference in the Noru's message which I'd like to draw your attention to. The Universal House of Justice says, Participation in the discourse on peace and oneness in all its numerous facets is another way in which the followers of Baha'u'llah assist souls to look to the future with a vision transcending the challenges and limitations of society today and work together to better understand the essential prerequisites of a peaceful society and make it a reality. 
Now, what stood out to me here is that we often think about very specific discourses in which we engage, like race unity or the environment. But I think, and remember, this is just a personal view here, but I think the Universal House of Justice here is helping us see that peace and oneness is a meta-narrative because they frame it as a meta-discourse with all its numerous facets. See, for me, on a personal level, this creates a banner under which so many of our discourse-related initiatives will land. And that's this call for participation in the discourse on peace and oneness. And of course, they give us an incredibly inspiring close where they quote from Abdu'l-Bahá. He says, I hope this new year will be happy and blessed and will become the cause of the attainment of divine assistance and confirmation so that ye may become the cause of the unity of the world and proclaim the oneness of the human race, may change enemies into friends, and make those who are deprived the confidants of the mysteries of the world's great peace. So let's reflect on the three ambitions that Abdu'l-Bahá voices for us here. First, that we become the cause of the unity of the world and proclaim the oneness of the human race. Now that's our message. Then, that we change enemies into friends. I mean, what a challenge. That's a lot of what we've been exploring in our sequence on the science of depolarization. It's the ultimate challenge, right? So this is our method. And finally, that we make those who are deprived the confidants of the mysteries of the world's great peace. And that's the result. How truly inspiring. Wow, this message was so powerful in helping us look beyond the doom and gloom so we could see just how urgent the hour is, how important the mission, and how critical the need for us to arise and promote the cause of universal peace and the oneness of humanity. Now, remember, this podcast is not a substitute for your own study. Hopefully, it will help inspire you to study these three messages for yourself and see how they speak to you. And I've included links to these three messages in the description of this podcast. And my review here is brief. I didn't cover all aspects of the message. And this is further reason for you to study the message for yourself. And my apologies for all my inadequacies and in better covering the full depth of this message. As I was doing the research for today's podcast, I often felt overwhelmed. Like, how could I possibly fully express the ideas here? Because they're just so incredibly powerful. So be forgiving in overlooking some of my shortcomings here. But that's what our journey together is all about, right? It's about us trying to find our path moving forward. Well, that's it for today. Once again, I want to thank you for joining in our conversation for social transformation. And I hope you'll join me again next time on Society Builders. Society builders paved the way to a better world, to a better day. A united approach to building a new society. There's a crisis facing humanity. People suffer from a lack of unity. It's time for a better path to a new society. Join a conversation for social transformation. Society builders. Conversation for social transformation, society builders. So engage with the local communities and explore the exciting possibilities. We can elevate the atmosphere in which we move. The paradigm is shifting, it's so very uplifting. 
It's a new beat, a new song, a brand new groove. Join a conversation, a social transformation, society builders. Join a conversation, a social transformation, society builders. The Baha'i faith has a lot to say Helping people discover a better way With this cause and social action Framed by unity Now the time has come to lift the game And apply the teachings of the greatest name And rise to meet the glory of our destiny Join a conversation A social transformation Society builder Social transformation, society builders.